Uh, and so, hi everyone, welcome to the fifth talk of the 2024 Invited Seminar Series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. We are delighted to host a renowned researcher and pioneer in the field of computer vision and machine learning, Dr. Matthew Turk, as our guest speaker today. Uh, this talk is co-hosted by uh, the uh, the San Antonio Computer Society chapter and also Computer Society chapters of uh, Chicago County, Pikes Peak, Albuquerque, Boise, and then the Boise Joint Chapter of uh, Signal Processing and Robotics and Automation Society. As always, we have Open Research Institute in cooperation as our media partner for the entire series. Professor Tark has given consent to record the talk and upload our uh, upload the video to our YouTube channel for later viewing. I'd like to request uh, our, our vice chair, uh, Dr. Piraj Khuram Shahi, to formally introduce our speaker to the audience. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are pleased to have Professor Matthew Turk with us. Uh, Dr. Turk is the president of Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago and an emeritus professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Virginia Tech, Carnegie Mellon University, and MIT. He has worked at Martin Marietta Aerospace, Lithia NCMAC, Telius Research, and Microsoft Research. He has served as general or program chair of several major conferences, including CBPR, ACM Multimedia, IEEE Face and Gesture Recognition, ICMI, and WACV. He co-founded an augmented reality startup company that was acquired by PTC Vuforia in 2016. Dr. Turk has received several best paper awards, and he is an ACM fellow, IEEE fellow, IAPR fellow, AAIA Fellow, AIIA Fellow, and the recipient of 2011-2012 Fulbright Nokia Distinguished Chair in Information and Communications Technologies. Now, with that introduction, uh, Professor Trick, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, and you can still hear and see me, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I'm not sure I can see a chat, so let me know if there's anything you know I should know about. And and also, if people have questions uh, during the presentation, please feel free to stop me. You'd be happy to uh, take questions as I go. Um, so it's it's nice to uh, talk to the San Diego chapter of the Computer Society. Um, I was actually born in San Diego and lived up the road in Santa Barbara for 19 years. I've been in Chicago for the last five years, which is a little different from California. Um, although there are a lot of positives of Chicago, I, I also miss uh, California. Um, so I, I thought it'd be kind of fun and interesting to talk about regulation. And, and this is not a technical talk. It's uh, there'll be no equations or anything. Um, but this is something that I think is both interesting and and consequential and, and important. And and you know largely because. Um, there is no guarantee that any regulation that does come is going to be done well. And, and I think uh, it matters, you know, both for technical people and, and for society at large. And, and, um, and then also for me personally, there, there are a bunch of ethical and legal issues um, regarding face recognition that kind of got me interested in these things in the first place. Um, and now, you know, of course, there's a lot going on in the AI space in general. Um, and it seems like a lot of my colleagues in academia, in particular, are, are you know, sort of are, are too busy to follow the regulation discussions uh, very closely, kind of day to day or week to week, um, you know, because they have real work to do, I guess. Um, but but this topic again is is important. It's going to impact us, I think, um, both in in industry and academia as we go forward. Um, so it's 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 worth uh, talking about and, and thinking about a bit. So just figured we'd spend some time thinking about this space, particularly in in face recognition, and then more broadly in AI in general. So of course we we all know I think that it's the age of AI, right? So you hear this all the time, um, documentaries, books, um, uh, YouTube videos by Iron Man. Um, New York Times articles, Harvard Business, Business Review, and of course, 
nothing's really happening until Ted tells us about it. But um, so all kinds of things in, in society today tells it, tell us that it's the age of AI, okay? Everybody says that. Um, but in, in many ways, in, in recent years, thinking about this age, this age of AI, we, we're, we're kind of torn, I think, in some ways as a society between two perhaps extremes, the, the, the kind of Pollyanna view of things um, and the chicken little view of things on, on the left and the right here. So you know, the Pollyanna view is sort of unwavering optimism. And for AI, it's like, you know, this is great and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to solve so many problems and then we've got nothing to worry about. The, the chicken little view is basically, you know, the sky is falling, the, the alarmist view. Um, and and we, we tend to hear both of these kind of extreme views a lot. And, and my question is sort of, is, is there sort of a point in the middle that we're converging to, I guess, and, and finding a way to, to, to reap benefits while also being careful about the dangers? And I hope that's where we're going, uh, but, but I want to talk about that a bit today. Um, so on the Pollyanna-ish side of things, you, you hear quotes like this. Humanity is at the edge of a revolution driven by AI. It has the potential to be one of the most significant and far-reaching revolutions in history. This revolution is unstoppable. And that's actually by a book by uh, Henry Kissinger and um, uh, the former uh, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, and Dan, Dan Huttenlocker, the, um, the dean of computing at MIT. So a very optimistic view. On the other side, we've got uh, thing quotes like, we haven't had an AI Hiroshima yet, uh, but for AI, survival means either controlling humans or getting rid of them. That sounds kind of ominous. Or another quote, there's, there's a 10% chance that AI will lead to human extinction within the next three decades. Um, that first quote of, of those two is from Yashua Bengio, one of the godfathers of AI, essentially. And the uh, second quote, is from Jeff Hinton, another godfather of AI. So, you know, they're very well positioned AI people who are pretty negative, pretty negative about things, or at least about the potential of things. And there are other people who are extremely uh, positive about things. Um, and, and so, again, this kind of Pollyanna versus chicken little view of, you know, amazing break, breakthrough, breakthroughs, wonderful possibilities, you know, what could go wrong versus all these negative things, discrimination, bias, lack of transparency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we, we've been having this kind of discussion for the past several years, I think, in various ways, publicly and in academia and in companies. Um, and my, my personal view is that a few years ago, I was getting increasingly worried that the, the chicken littles, I guess, on, on this side of the discussion, we're having a lot of sway on public opinion and legislation possibilities, but I was also at the same time worried that much of the power and the money and all was with the Pollyannas of the world, sort of, you know, thinking more about the, the amazing potential and stuff and not worrying so much about the potential dangers. Um, fast forward a few years, and I actually think we have a chance at finding a reasonable middle ground that as many white papers and proclamations and things like that have stated can balance the the um, the benefits of innovation while mitigating the risks of, of AI and related things. And I don't think this is a an obvious and easy thing to do. Um, but I have some guarded optimism, I guess, that we're moving in that direction. We're, we're sort of maybe going to be able to find the sweet spot in between these two extremes. And, and so I think we're really kind of in, in what I would say is more the AI, the age of AI regulation, um, I guess, than, than just the AI. So in this talk, I want to kind of go through some, some things I, I think about this age of AI regulation, some, some important things that got us to this point, some things currently in progress, and, and actually some ways people can get involved in the ongoing discussion as well. Um, so here's one view of a path to AI regulation, a sort of long-term view. So in uh, 1942, I think it was, Isaac Asimov came up with, with his three laws of robotics. And despite the name robotics, it's really kind of AI-ish sort of laws, you know, the, about how, how intelligent systems 
should act or should do things with respect to humanity as well. And I think that was actually a pretty important event kind of in the overall long scale uh, path to of AI and, and to, AI, uh, to AI regulation. Another thing um, uh, a few years later was uh, Norbert Wiener from MIT who sort of coined the, the term and, and really started the field of cybernetics. Uh, he had some very influential publications in, in the late uh, 40s and, and early 50s. Um, and a quote from one of those publications was that, uh, it's been long clear to me that modern ultra rapid computing machine was in principle an ideal central nervous system to an apparatus for automatic control long before Nagasaki and the public awareness of the atomic bomb. It had occurred to me that we were here in the presence of another social potentiality of unheard of importance for good and for evil. And he talked a good bit about the, the potential downside of competing technology in general and, and also in cybernetics and AI kinds of things, you know, many decades ago. Um, fast forward a, a few years and Joseph Weizenbaum from MIT he was the creator of the ELISA system. Uh, he wrote a book called Computer Power and Human Reason, Reason, Human Reason from Judgment to Calculation um, in 1976, I believe. And he, he raised a lot of concerns and, and potential dangers about AI in, in a number of ways and, and was very much going against the grain at that time. Um, some years later, in the uh, early 2000s, 2001 to 2008 and, and 2009, were the first sort of very significant uh, pieces of legislation, in, in these cases having to do with face recognition related to AI, um, by states, by Texas, and, and then by uh, Illinois, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and then in, uh, eight, in 2016, was this uh, what became a very well-known uh, ProPublica art article about machine bias, about the, the compass system and about using AI to, um, to uh, uh, in, in recidivism, in predicting recidivism, in, in predicting the, um, whether so someone should be given a back bank loan and some other things like that. And there, there was a very influential article by ProPublica that, that looked into a lot of this and was very critical about some of these systems. Um, and then also in 2016 was um, work by this Georgetown University Center that uh, really brought, shone light, shined light on uh, uh, some of the work in face recognition and some of the harms uh, that were coming to individuals and potential harms that could be coming to people through these kinds of systems. Um, a, another important point, I think, even though it's not in AI specifically, was the GDPR, uh, the passage of GDPR uh, in 2018, the European regulation that has been very influential worldwide because companies worldwide had to uh, be under it and, and deal with it. Um, and I believe in the long run, GDPR has generally been seen as quite positive, even by the companies that had to change their uh, practices and procedures because of GDPR. Um, so I think it is, has been an example of legislation that overall, even though there was a lot of complaint about it early on, overall, a lot of society has, been, has seen it as being positive in a number of directions. Um, and so, in general, over the past, say, uh, five years, um, there have been a lot of concerns and warnings about AI-related issues. There have been various calls for regulation. There have been lots of debates about regulation. And there's been kind of piecemeal regulation here and there. And, and I'll talk about all of these to some degree. The question for me, and I think for us as a community, is are we moving towards really effective, useful, comprehensive regulation that's neither too onerous nor too light, um, that will really, you know, be, be a good thing for, for society in general, or are we, you know, sort of not going to be able to get to that place? Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about where things are, how they've kind of gotten here um, um, and where they may seem to be going 
and also how people can get involved in, in um, things related to this if they're interested. So um, in general, I think an undercurrent of this whole discussion is that in, in recent years, the past you know, five plus years, five to 10 years maybe, trust in technology in general and trust in AI more specifically has been declining. You can find this in all kinds of reports and articles these days in recent years. Uh, public surveys and things like that have, have not shown very uh, good, in, uh, good trust in terms of the public and, and their um, AI in general, big tech and, and technology overall. And one of the very telling things of that was in, in 2018, with the Cambridge Analytica scandal or with Facebook and, and others and and how the um, see so can, can you see my uh, my cursor here? Yeah, okay. Um, so you can see in in early 2018 there was a huge decline in trust, basically how, how people felt whether Facebook was committed to to protecting their privacy and their personal information. And this was largely because of what, you know, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and, and the discussion around this. And things have not gotten a lot better since then. I think there, there was a significant decline in trust, especially around them, but even others kind of before then as well. And in general, there's been sort of a mistrust about AI technologies and, and a number of kind of instances of things and, and general reasons why this has come about, general concern about technology displacing jobs, um, bad online behavior that people have called out and, and that have hurt various people, um, concern about the opaque decision-making that AI and similar decisions have, uh, failures of self-driving cars that have been quite public, um, reports of machine learning tools that have amplified biases that exist in the, in the data in various ways, um, language generation systems that have sort of gone bad in very public ways. Um, discussion about the carbon footprints of these large language models and, and similar sorts of things. And of course, deep fakes and, and how that can affect elections and other things in society. Um, and then a whole bunch of things related to face recognition. So, so I wanna talk about those in specific for a little while, and then I'll move back into the AI space more, more generally. So over the past several years, there, there have been really quite a few uh, very public uh, news items and reports about errors and bias and, and other negative things related to face recognition systems. So Google photos, labeling, uh, fo labeling photos of some people as gorillas, um, claims of systems that uh, say they can determine a personality type, for example, whether they're a terrorist or not, or a pedophile or not, or a criminal or not, or their sexual orientation or political orientation or things like that from just their face images. Um, bad performance, um, some very uh, public uh, misclassification of face recognition systems. Um, Facebook having to, to apologize after mislabeling various kinds of images. And then on the right side here are images of five individuals in recent years who have been imprisoned, at least partially due to the use of face recognition systems in police informant, uh, police um, uh, uh, enforcement. And even though the number is not large, these incidents are, you know, they're, they're terrible for these individuals involved. They're, they're, they're inappropriate, they're insulting, they're reinforcing negative stereotypes, they're personally damaging. Um, there, there are all kinds of questions about the individual circumstances here and, you know, how much was technical failure versus human failure and stuff, but, but still, um, these have caused lots of discussion and concern about um, face recognition systems. And, and of course, many systems have been decommissioned, Amazons, Microsofts, IBMs, Googles, Facebooks, and many uh, face rec data sets have been uh, taken away uh, or removed from public access because of these sorts of things. Um, in addition to these sorts of things, there have been growing reports uh, in recent years about face recognition-based surveillance in various countries. And here I list things related to China and Turkey and India, but, but not just these countries, um, in, in many others as well. Um, and, and sometimes for 
reasons where the, the populations are quite happy about it, or at least, you know, some parts of the populations are quite happy about it. And, and there may be, you know, very serious um, under policed situations and, and safety situations, but nonetheless, there are concerns about um, the, the level of surveillance in, in multiple countries and, and situations brought about by face recognition and, and other kinds of AI based technologies. So overall, there, there are really significant concerns about face recognition technologies being biased and racist, about the data privacy issues related to face recognition systems, uh, consent issues, um, the transparency of these systems, uh, the, the problem of function creep, that the system can be potentially put in place for a very limited and specific and, and worthwhile reason, but then people can use it for other reasons potentially uh, that were not so uh, approved or, or okay. Um, the permanence potentially of a face, re face recognition system where you can't undo sort of your face as, as, a, as a biometric um, and, and all kinds of things. And to some degree, it just feels creepy to a lot of people. And, uh, and the scale at which uh, the scale and speed at which these systems can work compared to, you know, individual police or individual citizens doing this in, uh, in the past is quite different. So, so there's been a lot of concern and, and a lot of pushback and, and backlash uh, uh, groups calling for banning of face recognition systems in general or in particular contexts like for police use or public uh, uh, um, use of face recognition. Um, one thing that is now like four years old or so is John John Oliver's uh, 20 or 21 minute piece um, on, well, I forget what the show is called, late night show that, that he did a few years ago. And I, I think it's it's still really interesting to watch. And, and, and of course it's funny because John Oliver is funny, but it's also very clever in the way he kind of puts together at least how things were a, about four years ago in this space. And and you know concerns that people were addressing and, and that he expresses and, and so these are very real I, I think and not to be dismissed easily. Um, meanwhile, with, with all of these concerns uh, being raised, there has been increased broad deployment of face re facial recognition systems over the past several years. So in you know of course our mobile phones, in various devices we have in our homes and other places. The, the use of face recognition in, in stores and in schools and apartment buildings and in hospitals, the police use usage of face recognition um, in, in airports and border control. Um, it's, it's proliferating uh, while all of these concerns are going on day by day. Um, and, and there's a very large market and, and industry is is very motivated or at least parts of industry are very motivated to be taking advantage of that market. Um, and there are, you know, very, there are very realistic situations that stores, for example, say our employees are made more safe by the use of this face recognition system in our store. You know, where, of course, the other side of things that uh, is that their customers may be complaining about, you know, that being uh, surveillance that they don't want or don't need. Um, so, you know, again, it's a, it's a very complicated situation. Um, in law enforcement, some police departments have been banning um, or, or, or cities or, or towns or states or, or other municipalities have been banning the use of face recognition systems um, or, or severely limiting them in some ways. Um, on the other hand, other police systems have been pushing them very hard, saying we need these systems in order to do our job, in order to you know, catch the bad guys as as you, the citizens, expect us expect us to be doing. We we need these systems. And two interesting examples were, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, the the Vermont um, police, uh, the Vermont, Vermont Attorney General asked Vermont lawmakers to loosen the ban they had already made on the police use of facial recognition because the police really wanted it and and really felt like they needed it to help solve them. To help solve many things, including uh, child sexual exploitation cases. So again, it's it's you know a complicated situation, and uh, um, this this uh, image on the right here is a New York Times op-ed piece from several years ago. It was the police commissioner from New York City 
basically talking about how useful in the job of policing face recognition systems have been and can, can still be. And they've also been used to clear innocent suspects in police uh, investigations. So again, it's a complicated uh, situation. And so it kind of, you know, to, to me and to a lot of people sort of brings us to this, you know, this, this Gary Lawson, Gary Larson cartoon as a, uh, you know, funny thing, but, it, but it's a really kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation that either direction, there, there are problems and, and there's criticism and concern, but, but it's hard really, you know, some sense to say one direction is like okay and the other is completely not you know or vice versa um so what i think we need to do we as a society and and we as technical people can be part of this and important helpers in this is to work on figuring things out somewhat making the situation situation better uh, work on both you know making systems better like in reducing error rates and reducing biases um, improving performance, improving security, improving explainability and things like that, but also thinking through and being engaged in this whole space and, and dialogue in terms of regulation and such. So let me just kind of summarize a little bit in terms of face recognition technologies, where I think this path has taken us sort of from a big picture. So, you know, where we are today uh, over, over the many years. So, Initially in face recognition, the, the motivation to do research was for a number of things, uh, partly just kind of scientific and, and of interest. You know, can, can we build computers to do this kind of thing? It's something people do, and it seems like an interesting question to know if, if computers can do them too. Um, and, and then there are practical applications too, like secure, secure access to a room or, uh, um, arranging your photos, you know, your, your hundreds or thousands of photos together easily, or logging onto your cell phone quickly, or, or policing, or, or um, border patrol, or things like that. But a, a lot of practical applications, I guess, were original motivations. And then as things started to, to develop, but, but not so successfully in, in the early years of face recognition, there are a couple of very public, I, what I call redefining events. And, and one was the, the 2001 terrorist attacks that, that got a lot of people, especially in government, interested in things like face recognition technology to, to be able to recognize people going through airports and other kinds of things. And then the in the US, the, the 2012 Boston uh, Marathon bombings which um, that's kind of a long story in itself, but face recognition was not actually used there, but, but people later um, showed or at least argued how face recognition could have been useful there and might have been, been able to stop a thing like that. Um, so th th those two events were over a period of 12 years were quite influential, I believe, in pushing government and, and industry to some degree um, back towards uh, a face recognition as a more practical um, thing rather than just the kind of scientific scientific uh, um, main motivations initially. Um, and then growing public unease and mistrust kind of followed not long after some of these things and all kinds of things with, with I mentioned the Cambridge Analytica uh, situation, but uh, data breaches uh, uh, that are very large that, that could be um, problematic for uh, large-scale face recognition systems, uh, biases that, that started to become, become better known, um, the, the systems like the uh, Compass system I mentioned earlier with mortgage lending and recidivism and things like that, autonomous vehicle failures, a lot of these public things started to, to come about. Um, and then specifically in, in face recognition technologies, um, there is a uh, something in 2001 that was kind of public, a failure in some degree of face recognition technologies, and then bias being shown in various systems. Um, uh, Amazon and Microsoft and others who, who eventually took theirs out, and, and as I mentioned, individuals who've been very, um, who were harmed, and, and that's been, um, you know, very publicly discussed. So, so things, you know, started to change a bit somewhat in this overall, um, overall, uh, system, you know, view towards regulation. 
And then reports on increasing mass surveillance, as I mentioned in, in some countries, um, that you know, has been really concerning people. Um, and then an interesting thing to me is really over the years, the engagement of arts and humanities in various ways, whether it's you know, looking many, many decades back, novels like Frankenstein or George, well, Orswell, George Orwell's 1984 um, or Brave New World, these novels that kind of painted pictures in various ways of technology going bad and, and having significant harm in society. Um, or movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey or more recent things like Black Mirror or artists on the bottom here um, uh, sort of making their statements about uh, about various things in this space. There's been a lot of discussions been prompted by the arts and humanities, which I think is really interesting and, and really um, worth paying attention to in, in many ways. Um, and then public pressures and private responses. So basically, groups that have become very public about making statements uh, that face recognition should be banned or there should be a moratorium or, or something like that. Um, th there have been a lot in recent years that have come out very strong uh, in, in favor of those kinds of things. Um, and then finally, uh, sort of the, the tail end of all these things is the legal, <coughs> excuse me, the legal responses or, or at least the potential, the discussions that can lead to legal responses. And basically what that has been so far in, in the face recognition space has been kind of very piecemeal. Um, various cities or, or areas, in some cases, state, excuse me, states passing laws related to face recognition, but they're all different. In some cases they cover police, in some cases they cover any public space, in some cases they cover other sorts of things. Um, in some cases, you you know walk across a county line and you have you know completely different rules. Um, so it's 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 very piecemeal, at least in the U.S. And all of this has has led or leads me and, and other people to to the question of you know what are the right legal perspectives in in face recognition technologies and then more general in in AI technology, who has the authority to legislate these matters. Should they be legislated on the local level or regional level or national or international or, or some combination of those? Um, and what should we or, or should uh, people regulate? Uh, government use, police use, uh, company use, individual use, particular use cases, particular space or spaces or, or, uh, or uh, applications. Should there be regulation? Should there be bans? Should there be moratoria? Who should be penalized? There are all kinds of interesting legal questions related to these things. Um, and, and different uh, groups of people tend to have different perspectives. So the, the lawyers have different perspectives from the policy people, from the government people, from the technical people. And um, what it, in my view is the most interesting point in this space is where all of these people come to the table and have discussions and try to understand each other's points of view. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen too often, but, uh, but I am pushing that to happen more often. So in the face recognition space, just to kind of finish this up before we move on to AI in general, there has been, um, in the US at least, uh, quite a bit of uh, legislation in terms of cities and, and, and states doing various things. Um, by now, uh, quite a number of cities in the U.S. have passed bans. Again, all different kinds of bans, some just police related, some more general. And, um, and, and I'll mention the state ones uh, in more detail in a bit. Um, but again, they're, they're very piecemeal. They're, they're not very you know, consistent. They kind of change from place to place. And in terms of federal uh, uh, coverage of face recognition, there have been a lot of uh, things that have been uh, proposed, but currently there's no real federal statute or regulation imposing a general constraint, constraint on face recognition technologies. These things on this slide are, are all proposed facial recognition legislations, but nothing is advanced, advanced beyond the proposed state, uh, which is hard to do with facial, with uh, federal uh, legislation. Uh, two, two very, um, meaningful, important pieces of, of state legislation are the Illinois BIPA uh, uh, Act, which was passed in 2008 and has been regulated quite a, or has been legislated or, or um, 
quite a bit in recent years. Um, and but it's just the state of Illinois. And with BEPA, this this act, it, it defines what a biometric identifier is. It basically says these things: a retina or iris scan, a fingerprint, a voice print, uh, a scan of of hand or face geometry are sort of disallowed in, in certain ways. But a question for this kind of uh, legislation is, well, what does this really mean from a technical perspective? And, and in this case specifically, what is a scan of face geometry? You know, for anybody who's who's in computer vision, I, I would posit that maybe that's not a very well-defined phrase in the field, a scan of face geometry. We, we all might have different views of, of what specifically that might mean. And so a company might be wondering, well, is my product or my method, is that a scan of face geometry? Is, is you know, work from decades ago, um, it was kind of 2D oriented, is that a scan of face geometry? Is a deep neural network that's doing kind of a holistic view of, of face recognition, is that a scan of facial geometry? Is uh, the way that Apple or others do iPhone uh, face recognition, is that a scan of face geometry? I, I, th I think that's kind of an unclear phrase, unfortunately. And, and it's one of the things that um, makes me want to have people from, uh, you know, from representing the technological point of views as, as points of view, as well as representing legal and, and other points of view at the table when this kind of legislation is, um, is actually drafted. Um, Texas is the other one. It actually had a, a law in 2001 that was kind of redone and, and was uh, passed as a new law in 2009, which also is quite similar to the uh, to the Illinois BIPA law. So this is the QB law or capture or use of biometric identifiers. Um, and to my understanding, this has only been um, uh, regulated twice so far, or only only been um, brought to court twice so far. Once beginning in in uh, February of 2022 versus uh, Facebook or Meta, and then once also in 22, uh, 2022 versus Google, uh, but very similar to the uh, Illinois BIPA law. Um, so having said all of that about AI, about face recognition, let, let's start talking a little bit about AI regulation. So in AI regulation, we can think about global things, uh, national and regional things, and then for me and, and for us particularly in, in um, uh, things going on in the US. And I'll go through a lot of stuff very, very quickly, but just kind of to kind of give an overall texture and sense of, of things that are going on. And, and perspectives that people have. So this is a chart that actually comes from this uh, recent uh, seventh annual AI index report that the uh, Stanford Human Centered AI Lab uh, or um, Center or whatever it's called puts out. If you're not familiar with this and you're inter interested in this AI space, I really encourage looking at this uh, annual AI index report. It has a lot of information, not just about legislative matters, but about technical matters and industry matters and and, and all. So it's really a, a rich source of information every year now in recent years about AI. Um, this chart here in particular shows in different countries um, people's opinions basically on our products and services using AR, AI having more benefits than drawbacks and um, the pink and blue are the two recent years, 2022 and 2023. And as you can see, this varies a lot by country with, with countries up in the 70% of, of yes and more benefits than drawbacks. And then some countries down in the uh, high 30%. And the US is down there uh, in, in second, second only to France in terms of being low um, in, in only a 37% rate. Um, so there is quite a difference throughout the world about how people perceive uh, the benefits versus the concerns or drawbacks of, of AI technologies. And, and this just shows in, in the world overall, the countries that have some sort of national strategy on AI. In some sense, in some cases that it's very loose, in some cases it's, a, it's more uh, comprehensive, but um, still there, there are a lot of countries that do, but, but a lot of uh, countries don't. Um, but even those that do, this chart shows ones that have a more restrictive uh, set of bills, and those are the pinks, versus more expansive 
set of bills related to AI. So this is worldwide and AI bills passed into law in sort of a set of representative countries. So it's AI laws here don't just mean things that prohibit AI kinds of things, but also things that, that push and, and perhaps fund or, or make it easier to do AI kinds of things. So there's a lot going on in the world, um, more every year, but again, both prohibitive and, and, and pro AI. Um, so you have to look into the details often to kind of figure out what specifically is going on. So on the global level, there are a few things that I'll just go over really quickly. These are relatively high level principles that are promoting AI, but also trying very hard to, to respect human rights and democratic values and to be careful about the use of AI globally as well. So one is the OECD AI principles. That's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And that has 38 uh, countries that are basically developed countries with mature economies, et cetera. And then um, the other is the G20 AI principles. So the G20 companies, countries, uh, these two are, are more or less the same kind of thing where they have values, values based principles and then recommendation for policymakers. And there's quite a few countries in the world that have committed to these principles. So very high level, nothing that itself has any teeth in terms of regulation for, the, for any individual country, but principles that are important to the countries uh, that have signed on to these. A similar kind of thing is the UNESCO uh, recommendation on the ethics of AI that was done in November, 2021. This was the first um, global standard on AI ethics, and it was adopted by all 193 member states of UNESCO. Um, and it also is a very high level kind of principle based uh, document um, um, about AI and uh, providing a universal framework of values, principles and actions to guide things, but itself does it itself doesn't you know, have any teeth to it. There's no enforcement capabilities. The, the point is to foster dialogue and consensus building about ethical is issues related to AI around the world. Um, another important thing globally, um, fairly recently, just, just about a year ago, was the Hiroshima AI Process Comprehensive Policy Framework. Now, this came out of or was part of the G7 Summit in Hiroshima just over uh, about a year ago. Um, and it was to facilitate building up inclusive global AI governance for the world's common good. Um, and so uh, it, it, it brought about um, principles and ideas for international codes of conduct and, and other um, recommendations for countries throughout the world and came up with 11 guiding principles about identifying, evaluating, and mitigating risks in AI throughout the AI life cycle. So, you know, from the very beginning to deployment and beyond of, of AI technologies. Um, another thing is the AI Global Alliance, which was a World Economic Forum initiative uh, that they put together. And this brought, brought together leaders both from government and from industry and academia and civil society to promote development and deployment of AI systems, but also to focus on transparency, inclusiveness, and ethically sound uh, behavior and deployment of AI systems. Um, and this had people from Microsoft, IBM, Google, OpenAI, you know, some top companies in the field, and also very uh, well-placed individuals in terms of people, both academics and industry people in uh, AI-related areas. Um, and then I think the, the last couple of things I'll mention are a global AI safety summit, which was in the UK uh, about six months ago in Bletchley Park. And um, this again, you know, brought together very influential companies and, and individuals and, and, and companies and all to talk about these issues. And there's a commitment here in this global AI safety summit to, to have continuing meetings and updating the state of things and um, and what these countries who are signing on to this are agreeing to do. And the next meeting is is actually next week in South Korea, largely virtual, but the, the next in-person meeting will be in February in France. 
Um, and one of the things that came out of this global AI uh, safety summit was this Bletchley Declaration on, on AI safety, um, where 28 countries, including the US, Germany, Japan, China, and others, um, sign on to this collective commitment to proactively manage both the risks associated with AI um, and to assure that, that we can move positively to, to you know, helpful AI systems in the world. Um, so, uh, and, and they also uh, sort of uh, agreed or committed to be doing this scientific report on approximately an annual va basis, um, which sort of every year is supposed to say, what's the state of the art, the state of science, how are things going in terms of risks? How are things going in terms of, you know, great advances and advances, important things we can do because of AI? And this is chaired by uh, Yashua Bengio, uh, again, one of the sort of godfathers of AI, a uh, very um, important academic in the field, and includes leading AI academics, as well as people from various um, uh, companies and, and countries. So um, all of these things that I'm mentioning here are global initiatives and, and individually none of them have any you know capability to um, to pass laws themselves or to uh, implement things but i think they do actually matter they, they do sort of provide um, coverage in a sense for then you know national and local leaders to say look this is important to the world and you know, see this declaration and this agreement and this other thing, and that gives me sort of cover to move forward with the things that we're doing on a national level or a more local level. So I think these national things are quite important, even though they they you know they will take some time to really uh, bear significant fruit. So so moving quickly to national um, and 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 kind of regional AI strategies. Uh, a few years ago, only a few countries had national AI strategies, and, and now there are about 75 countries that do. So there's been a lot of progress uh, on this in, in, in just the past five or so years. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting that a number of countries have been doing are, are what are called regulatory sandbox strategies. And what that basically means is sort of creating a temporary, like a six month or a year long regulatory safe space, which is used to test innovative regulations or, or innovative products and services um, and sort of figure out how does that work? If we you know, do, let, do allow this or don't allow that, what kind of constraints does that uh, uh, cause problematically or what kinds of things does that um, mitigate and, and help with? Uh, and this has been used by several countries in, in, in fintech, uh, financial tech, especially, but, but other areas as well. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in the AI space um, for countries and other areas to be using regulatory sandboxes. Um, of course, probably all of you know about or at least have heard about the European AI Act um, proposed a few years ago and, and finally adopted uh, uh, just a couple months ago. Um, the, the, the EU AI Act basically covers things by risk level, these four main risk levels of unacceptable, high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. Uh, and then another category was actually added more recently, general purpose AI. Um, and so there's sort of different rules for, for each of these uh, risk levels. So for example, in the unacceptable risk categories, there's really actually pages of of information and of, of you know definitions of what belongs in this category and suggestions for how to do the uh, how to treat these kinds of things. So for each level, there are you know many pages of information about this, um, and and the the vast majority of obligations in this EU model fall on the developers or providers of high end AI high risk AI systems, not as much on the users. Um, but the developers themselves. Um, now, the, the EU AI Act, again, itself doesn't have any uh, teeth in, in terms of it can't enforce anything, but the individual countries of the EU will be implementing their versions of this as they see fit. So I think kind of like the GDPR has done in recent years, this EU AI Act is going to be very influential and have a significant effect, not only in the EU countries, but, but beyond as well. 
Um, the UK has done a good bit in coming up with a national strategy, and out of that came came an, an AI safety institute, which is including you know really top people in, in AI. Um, they, they've uh, put out a very influential white paper about a pro-innovation approach to AI regulation. I would say in general, the UK has been very pro-innovation and kind of. The African Union, the 55 member nation member nations have been doing a lot um, related to AI and have come up with um, a, a strategy and, and development um, a policy for AI nations in general that, like the EU situation, the nations can then sort of determine what to do specifically, but individual nations can then use this framework to develop their own national strategies. Um, so it's, you know, like a lot of these things, it, it's a very good start and they're, they're very uh, smart and thoughtful people that are thinking through these issues. Um, by the way, I'm not mentioning China at all in this presentation because one, I think it's just very complicated what's going on in China um, and I've not been following it in as much detail as with some other places. But of course, what's going on in China is, is also very important globally in this space. So, so to get finally to the US and say a, a few things about that um, before I end, um, the, the black backdrop of US uh, politics is very important in any discussion about US regula uh, regulation. We've got this all, you know, ongoing tension of state versus federal issues in the US and sort of the, what I would say is the current government dysfunction, especially on a federal level in the US. And, and because of that, to some, to some degree, the use of, of executive orders rather than laws being passed to do various things. So, so there is no uh, national unifying framework for AI in general. Um, there's been a growing patchwork of regulations at the state and local level, but nothing nationally. Um, and, and companies actually in general, at least a lot of them, would really like a federal law because the, it's, it's tough trying to figure out what the law is in every little place and trying to be consistent and predictable. Um, so th there's a lot of value in having a national law and, and there, there've been a lot uh, proposed, but, but nothing that's really uh, gone all the way yet. Um, and, and so the number of state related bills um, is shown here uh, from 2016 to 2023. So the number of proposed bills in blue has been growing. Um, the number of passed is, is much smaller, but there have been some passed in recent years. And these have been largely in your state, in California, but also in Washington and Maryland and Massachusetts and Virginia. And then some states have, have not passed any at all. Um, so, for example, California has the uh, CCPR passed several years ago um, and the AB 331 passed a, a year or so ago and some other things related, not always to AI specifically, but to privacy and other sorts of things that at least have some impact in the AI discussions. Um, and, and there are a number of pending uh, things in, in California legislature right now. Illinois. Beyond BIPA that I mentioned from years ago has the AI video interview interview act that it passed uh, several years ago um, and other things that are in the works. Um, Texas has done things and recently and, and similar from North Dakota, Puerto Rico and West Virginia copying some things Texas has done um, in the past year, Indiana, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, West Virginia have have done things in, in the AI space. And overall, dozens and dozens have, of bills have been introduced in state legislatures, but still not too many things have passed at the state level. Um, Connecticut, in fact, just last week, uh, something passed, but the governor decided not to sign it into law, and it's probably not going to end up uh, becoming a law because he basically said, uh, we're better off waiting a little bit and working with the states and the federal government rather than sort of going out on their own. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic going on in the U.S. between states and, and federal uh, actions right now. Um, so on the federal level, 
Um, blue up here shows the number of propo proposed bills in, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, but pink shows the actual number of passed bills. So, so not a lot is getting passed and a lot is getting proposed because um, it's kind of hard to get things passed um, in, the, in the Senate and the House these days. Um, and here's a, 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 sh a show of the number of AI related regulations. So these are not necessarily laws being passed, but uh, eight government agencies at the federal level implementing their own uh, rules and regulations. So that has definitely been growing. And, and again, some of them are, are restrictive in the pink, but some of them are more expansive in the blue. So in, in recent years, a lot more has been restrictive. So there have been restrictions at the federal level, but not so much because of laws being, being passed because of things being done uh, in, at the agency level, essentially. Um, so despite no current US federal comprehensive or, or comprehensive AI or privacy laws, um, many existing laws have been used and just applied to the AI space. Uh, and many agencies have sort of taken their authority to regulate things in, you know, originally other spaces and apply those authorities, at least to some degree, to AI kinds of uh, applications. Um, so some of the key things in the White House uh, or overseen by the White House and, and other independent government agencies have been using their power to various degrees to at least have an impact on how AI has been developing and, and to some degree being watched over or regulated. Now, over the years, the, the past three administrations have done significant things. The Obama administration, um, mostly in, in publishing a series of reports on AI. The Trump administration actually had two different executive orders relating to AI maintaining American leadership in AI, and then promoting the use of trustworthy AI in the federal government. These were both, mo both mostly pro-AI, pro-innovation, um, not, so not so much mitigating risks and such. And then the, the big kahuna, in a sense, very, uh, recently, just last year, was the, or a little over a year ago, first of, first of all, was the Biden administration's blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, and then um, this uh, at the end of 2023, the executive order, which was the safe, secure and trustworthy development and use of AI. So just very quickly kind of running through a, a texture of you know, things related to that. There are a number of things over the past several years that the government has done in various ways that have been impactful, I believe, like the executive orders, like various agencies um, making certain rules and such. Some are federal guidance, some are federal laws. There was a National Security Commission on AI that was started back in 2018 that had very well-placed individuals from industry and from academia that gave really good advice to the federal government. There was the White House blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that I mentioned, which is very high level, but it has also gave a, a good set of, of principles and standards for agencies to consider. There's the NIST AI risk management framework that came out uh, a little over a year ago in response to some of these federal things that have that has been a very helpful, I think, um, framework for companies and, and um, other entities, including government entities, going through the process of um, initial thinking through an AI application, thinking about the data, thinking about the models being used, thinking about the output of the, of the system, um, and thinking about the impact on, on humans and on our planet. Uh, so it's actually been a very interesting uh, uh, framework um, that people can think their, about their process and their products uh, through this framework. Um, the DOD has done a number of things. Um, President Biden has gotten voluntary commitments from leading AI companies in a couple different uh, groups, a group of seven and then a group of eight. Uh, and they committed to these, these eight uh, voluntary, voluntary commitments here, which again are voluntary. And there's a well-known uh, phrase, asking big tech to police AI is like turning to oil companies to solve climate change. And so you can sort of maybe take it with a grain of salt, but it does provide 
you know, ammunition in a sense to, to employees of these companies, to shareholders of these companies, and to the, to the executives of, of the companies to say, you know, we, we need to do the right thing uh, in, in certain cases. So I, I do think this, this actually is important and has teeth. Um, so again, there have been a number of things, um, the, the Trump executive orders, National Security Commission on AI, Blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights, NIST management, uh, risk management framework, uh, these public commitments and, and other things that have led to really what recently has been the most impactful thing, which is um, the President Biden's executive order on on AI. And this has been a this is a sprawling directive. It covers a bunch of things. It basically requires all most, if not all, uh, agencies in the U.S. to do certain things. Um, and like to to designate a chief AI officer and and to do a bunch of other things, but um, but it has been very impactful. It has set standards for AI safety and security for these agencies to be considering. It's provide directives to government agencies, uh, all, a, a list of all kinds of agencies here, is where they where they have certain time frames in which to accomplish uh, requirements. Department of Transportation, Labor, Commerce, et cetera, Treasury, Energy, Homeland Security, Commerce, NIST, Commerce, Labor, Attorney General, and, and more. There are also a lot of proposed bills in Congress, some of which have come from this. Um, so anyway, I, I, I've, I've gone on too long already, but this is just to say that there's a lot going on in, in the federal government now. A lot of this is really you know, happening as we speak, and there are a lot of ways that uh, academics and and that engineers and companies and other places um, can have impact and and some are through um, RFIs requests for information that that various government agencies put out and and some are in IEEE and and ACM and and other uh, industry organization events where they connect in interested people to congresspersons or or their staff to talk about these things. Um, there are groups like the, the, there's a CRA, Computing Research Association, has a council that I'm on that deals with uh, various aspects of, of these issues. Um, there, there are really a lot of ways that people can get involved, as well as with research topics that, that overlap, you know, potential um, positive things for, for regulation and for risk mitigation. So there's just a whole bunch that, um, that can be done and, and that are in the process of of being done right now, which I just think makes it a really interesting space. So bottom line, it is the age of AI. It's uh, even more in some ways the, AI, the age of AI regulation. Momentum for regulation has been building steadily, um, both globally and locally. Um, there, are, there are ethics, uh, ethical frameworks, guidelines, codes of conduct, standards, things like this that are, are really good now for, for any individual or company or, or government agency or whatever to, to use as a guideline. The Biden executive order, I think, has been a really important uh, step forward, intangible in some ways, but, but very important. And fundamentally, I think we can't leave the legislation just to the legislators. So technical people, business people need to get involved in this process, in my view, and, and have a voice at the table so things are done well. Um, and, you know, by the way, a lot of technical people should now be thinking about becoming a chief AI officer for the Department of Energy or the Department of Homeland Security or, or something like that. These are new positions that, uh, that are going to be impactful. So again, it's the AI, the age of AI regulation. Um, I think I just said these things. And overall, all of the stuff kind of is a delicate balance of ethical matters, legal matters, technical matters, policy matters. And underneath all of it is this underlying cultural and society. And we have to figure out a way as a society to make this stuff work. I think it's possible. I think it's difficult and, and it requires a lot of work. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to recruit as many people as possible to, you know, take some part in this process. So sorry for going on a little long, but uh, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. And if there's time, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Professor Tark, for the very interesting and uh, wonderful talk. Uh, any question from the audience? I know we went a little bit over time, but yeah, feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, 
Uh, I actually have a, a question about one of the earlier parts of your talk. Uh, you mentioned that people's trust have gone down. So how, how, how do you like improve that that situation? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I wish there was a simple answer to that. Um, but, you know, I, th I think the. The process of trust in technology and in AI related things in general has been a um, many faceted and, and fairly long uh, situation. And, and so I think it really is going to take companies uh, winning back the trust of their customers. And, and, you know, for like social media companies, their customers is like everybody, right? Um, so really, you know, um, taking responsibility, t moving very far away from, you know, the old famous Mark Zuckerberg phrase of move fast and break things to, to taking a very public stance that we are going to be responsible citizens in, in ways that we have not in the past. Also, for for academics to to continue as I think have been done has been done in in recent years to take on the the AI and ethical and fairness kinds of questions as being important for us and for not just saying oh you know we just do do research we're not you know responsible for what happens to it I, I think we need to have a more thorough and responsible perspective on that. And then to some degree, it, it, I, I think good legislation has to be done to give people a sense that government also cares about individuals and at the same time cares about innovation moving forward. So it, it's really a, a, a multi-pronged approach. And I don't think it's an easy answer. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's going to take a long while um, if, if we're lucky to win that trust back. I see. Yeah. Uh, any question from the audience? I have a comment that uh, might take a minute. Sure, sure. Go ahead, John. Let's let's just take a hypothetical that um, I'm driving my car down the road that has a number of cameras on it that are connected to an AI system, and um, it's been programmed to recognize my activities, and somebody's hacked the system, which you know. Computer systems are never hacked. Well, let's say it's been hacked for some reason, and they've determined that I've left my house unattended, and now um, a criminal group comes in and ransacks my house and steals everything from me. One scenario. Next scenario, they use my biometrics for security for some place, and my biometrics get into a computer that is hacked by somebody who then uses um, uh, a, uh, a 3D printing system to mimic my face so that they can gain access to anything. Or what I've seen lately is um, if you have biometrics securing your phone, the police are allowed to use your biometrics to unsecure your phone without your permission. And so these are little things that I've seen going on that make me very uncomfortable about the ability of AI to hack into the computer system and the bad things that can happen because of biometrics being used to secure things. My trust is going to be hard to earn. Uh, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if there's a specific question there or, you know, just sort of the comment, uh, but, but those are important concerns, I think. And, and those are the kinds of things that to win back trust, it can't be just window dressing, you know, but it has to be actually very well thought out responses to those sorts of scenarios, you know, and a lot of, of other scenarios that can harm people like you and, and me, but, but also scenarios that can harm, you know, minority communities in various ways that, that some of us may not tend to think about as kind of being first order problems. Uh, so, so there are a lot of issues like that. I do actually believe that all of these kinds of things can be addressed if, if designed, you know, from the ground up properly. And that's not to say necessarily that they can be completely eliminated. Eliminated. 
you know, I'm not sure that that any problems can be completely eliminated. Um, but I do believe there are design methods. There are frameworks that can be put in place. Uh, there are regulations. There are uh, other things that if done well and done thoroughly, and, and I don't think it's impossible that, that, that those things take place, uh, can severely limit the things that can go wrong, the things that, you know, would make us uncomfortable or, or more or beyond that to a degree that we would also, you know, be able to see the benefits of using the technologies in various ways. And, and we have, we can't forget that, that there are life saving and, and other possibility, other positive, you know, possibilities in the use of technologies in these various ways. Um, so in, in my view, we shouldn't only focus on the negatives, although the negatives are very important and we should never, you know, count those as, as trivial. So, so this is a complex space, you know, and, and that's why I think the right people need to be involved. Really smart people need to be involved in thinking through what are the right ways to approach these kinds of things. Uh, and, and in the past, the overlooking how things can be misused, like all the data for my Amazon can be used to profile me or uh, all my uh, text messages can be used to identify me as, as a particular group member or particular leaning for politics. Uh, anything that can be twisted to make money or control something. Um, and that's not addressed very well by anybody because why would you put out a product you can't make a profit with? And so the difficulty in actually making this work properly uh, without having hazardous side effects, it's not going to be easy. Yeah, I agree. I, I think a lot of the things that you're talking about is to some degree the consequence of the general philosophy of move fast and break things. And 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 of like you said, you know, profit being the the only, you know, really viable purpose of these things. And and those those things have to change. I think they can, but it, but it's a long-term proposition and, and it's not an easy proposition by any means. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Professor Park. Uh, I think yeah, we uh, we are uh, a bit out of like o over time, but that that's totally fine. Uh, if there are any more questions to Professor Tark, feel free to reach out to him or to me. I can. If anybody wants a copy of the slides, for example, I'd be happy to share them. Yeah, please. Uh, can you send a copy to me? Uh, I, I can share it with the with the video. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, and uh, we have a talk coming up tomorrow. Uh, it's at Qualcomm SKU building. It's on Bionic Hands. There will be some demo. Uh, so if you are in San Diego, feel free to uh, register and join. Uh, we'll send an email through the like to the IEEE members of the societies. Uh, thanks. Thank you.